so this will be the outline of our discussion what is ascites what are the causes what are the indian scenario or the indian uh, picture like uh, then what is the approach to ascites by history and examination then what is the approach to ascites by doing an ascitic fluid tap and an exam of the fluid and then what to do next so ascites is any free fluid in the peritoneal cavity it can be water or a serous fluid exuding from the peritoneum it can be pus it can be blood it can be chyle it can be urine it can be dialysis fluid or any combination of these okay so the clinical features they uh, stem from the collection of fluid per se which leads to abdominal swelling abdominal pain early satiety fullness thinning of the abdominal skin with prominent veins umbilical protrusion or umbilical hernias then uh, inguinal hernias varicose veins and dyspnea because the diaphragm is pushed up the lungs and the heart are compressed and if the ascitic uh, collection is very large then even orthopnea because on lying down the diaphragm itself moves up okay so these are the symptoms related to ascites per se then the clinical features of ascites due to the underlying causes uh, which can be within the abdomen or systemic causes outside the abdomen so the whatever disease is causing ascites can cause can produce or present with its own symptoms and signs for example the local causes are the infections they can be within the abdomen while they are mostly within the abdomen they can begin in the abdomen or they can start somewhere and then metastasize to the abdomen like metastatic abscesses uh, they can be acute or chronic then uh, abdominal pelvic tumors are a very important uh, local cause pancreatitis uh, due to intense inflammation again causes uh, ascites then vascular causes due to obstruction of the ivc or the hepatic veins or the portal vein outside the liver then another local or a systemic cause whatever you may call it is uh, sle because sle has polycirrhosis so the all the major cirrhosal cavities like the site the peritoneal cavity pleural cavity and the pericardial cavity can have inflammation and they can have uh, fluid collection so patient may have ascites pleural effusion pericardial effusion so then the systemic causes so these are very well known to you the chronic liver disease cirrhosis associated with portal hypertension the cardiac causes namely congestive cardiac failure chronic constrictive pericarditis right sided heart failure due to cor pulmonale or restrictive cardiomyopathy then nephrotic syndrome uh, hypoalbuminemia due to any cause which can be nephrotic syndrome it can be protein losing enteropathy it can be a malnutrition uh, then hypothyroidism should not be forgotten hypothyroidism is a very common cause Uh, of generalized puffiness and fluid collection by far the systemic causes outnumber the local causes so whenever you see ascites please first think of a systemic cause they are much more common okay and so this was just a little bit of literature that i am showing you uh, somebody from ahmedabad uh, they did a study on 150 cases on the etiology in 2018 they found that commonest cause 73% was cirrhosis second was tuberculosis with 15% uh amongst females they found that cirrhosis was relatively less common 37% second most common was malignancy see not tuberculosis but malignancy renal cardiac and then tuberculosis so a slight gender disparity cirrhosis is less common amongst females so the other causes like malignancy especially the pelvic organ malignancy in the females then renal causes cardiac causes they become far more commoner in the females so this is a point to remember so when you have a female with ascites your outlook should be slightly different when you have a male with ascites uh, you are predominantly dealing with tuberculosis uh, cirrhosis or tuberculosis that covers most of your things so in the female with ascites you need to have a broader uh, perspective uh, 
again the same thing the uh, when they combined males and females together 60% cases were due to cirrhosis 15% were due to tuberculosis okay then there was another study from bihar in 2020 this was a very recent study uh, here also they found that uh, cirrhosis was around 40% tuberculosis was 34% uh so here the percentage of cirrhosis was lesser and tuberculosis was higher probably uh, they are dealing with a state like bihar where infections are more common and uh, they also have been having alcohol prohibition for some time now so maybe alcohol as a cause of cirrhosis has come down amongst the cases of cirrhosis again alcohol was the highest then you had hepatitis b c was not that common okay uh in the age groups if you see then majority cases are seen between 41 to 60 years of age and uh, males outnumber females in ascites cases when you see the clinical presentation the commonest symptom is abdominal discomfort naturally very logical anorexia is a very very prominent complaint icterus is very prominent obviously that means that the liver is the cause of the ascites okay then abdominal pain nausea these are all because of the local complaints and uh, so these were the common symptoms with which patients of ascites present some of them are due to the ascites some of them are due to the cause of the ascites for example cough cough is whether it can be because of some diaphragmatic irritation or sub diaphragmatic collection or it can be because of some tuberculosis in the lung which is causing a tubercular ascites or it can be because of a malignancy in the lung which is causing a malignant ascites okay so these are the common symptoms then there was this study from himachal pradesh okay these are all indians so this is the indian perspective which i am giving you okay so here again cirrhosis was the leader second was tuberculosis so if you remember cirrhosis and tuberculosis one is a systemic cause one is a local cause and then probably malignancy the, these three will cover most of your cases of ascites that we see in india okay as these three studies have told you that cirrhosis is number one cause tuberculosis is number two cause and then we can also complete the list by adding malignancy to the list this this probably covers almost 80 to 85% of your cases so having known the distribution and the likely epidemiology in india what should be our approach so i have written cardiac first but let's see the liver uh, diseases first so when should you suspect liver disease when the patient has jaundice malnourishment weight loss itching lethargy low grade fever due to chronic hepatitis obviously history of alcohol intake blood transfusions any unsafe surgeries high risk behavior which can lead to acquiring hpv hcv obesity never forget non alcoholic fatty liver disease that this is going to be a very very predominant or very common cause of uh, chronic liver disease as we go ahead Uh, and nash or nfld is already the commonest cause of chronic liver disease in the west here it is soon going to uh, be at least third or second very soon uh, then patient patient may have features of portal hypertension such as upper gi bleeding splenomegaly uh, dilated veins then when you examine the patient you may find features of chronic liver cell failure uh, like uh, this cartoon is showing you know hepatic encephalopathy coma peter hepaticus spider nevi gynecomasia loss of pubic hair so all from top to bottom this list is probably not even complete like this another cartoon which is showing you bruising petechiae muscle wasting spider nevi uh, clubbing armor rhythm wasting of muscles hypotonia vitamin deficiency especially because of malabsorption of the fat soluble vitamins so all, all these all these features you must look for in your patient of ascites okay 
and if these are present any of those or any combination then certainly liver disease must be on the top of your mind okay then when do you suspect a, a cardiac cause now cardiac cause it, again if the patient has features of cardiac disease so the dyspnea should be there before the onset of ascites because then that would mean uh, pulmonary edema or right ventricular failure uh, if the dyspnea starts after the onset of ascites when the ascites has become moderate or massive then it is unlikely to be a cardiac cause so presence of prominent orthopnea paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea chest pain palpitations when the edema when the patient has anasarca and he gives the history that it started with the pedal edema okay which is classically uh, a cause of heart failure the presentation of heart failure pedal edema first then if the patient is already a known case of heart disease for example rheumatic heart disease ischemic heart disease cardiomyopathies and then he or she presents with ascites then uh, it is most likely the under the cardiac disease is the cause of ascites or the cardiac failure so when you examine such a patient you will find some pulse or bp abnormality the jvp will be raised and if there is tr then you will find prominent v wave then other features of cor pulmonale on examination of the precordium like loud p2 left parasternal heave the murmur of tricuspid regurgitation hepatomegaly which may be pulsatile and then splenomegaly so this is one small dictum that if you have splenomegaly in a patient of heart disease then three things become very very important chronic constrictive pericarditis tricuspid regurgitation which may be organic or functional and infective endocarditis so remember this cardiac disease with splenomegaly think of these three things okay then what if there is no suggestion of any liver disease or any cardiac disease and the patient has uh, an ascites with anasarca prominent facial edema periorbital edema then valvular or scrotal edema for some reason the valvular and scrotal edema is quite prominent early on in in uh, uh, nephrotic uh, causes uh, although if there is massive heart failure you will find it there also but it is not that common then uh, patient may complain of some hematuria oliguria frothy urine so you have to ask then if there are repeated infections deep vein thrombosis has happened because of loss of the anticoagulant proteins in the urine diarrhea why is diarrhea happen in nephrotic syndrome because there is gut edema the lining of the gut becomes edematous because of loss of albumin so the interstitial fluid expands and because of that it mucosal edema there is a malabsorption so diarrhea happens then if there are any features of sle with sle can very easily cause kidney involvement and nephrotic syndrome or a nephrotic syndrome then secondary amyloidosis we should never forget because we have lot of tuberculosis cases we have destroyed lungs which can present as bronchiectasis we have lot of rheumatoid arthritis cases so if this kind of history you find in the background and the patient is coming with ascites then always think of a secondary amyloidosis the aa amyloidosis okay then never forget to ask family history of kidney disease family history of nephrotic syndrome family history of autoimmune diseases like sle okay uh, then there are many uh, drugs nephrotoxic drugs due to for weight loss herbal drugs which patients are taking they can also cause kidney disease okay so once you had a look at the systemic causes these are the major systemic causes okay then if you don't find anything uh, of this sort then you can suspect a local cause so when should you suspect a local cause when you have a predominant or isolated or early or a massive ascites where the ascites is the predominant feature the other part of parts of the body parts are not uh, uh, edematous 
or the ascites presents very early what is called as ascites precox where the ascites is appearing much before the lower limb edema so classically that is seen in pericardial and tricuspid valve disease okay but the other symptoms like if the patient has prominent fever then peritonitis and tuberculosis should be high on your differential uh mark of abdominal pain or tenderness on the examination again pancreatitis peritonitis mark weight loss or cachexia immediately you should be alerted to malignancy in the abdomen if you are dealing with an elderly patient with onset of ascites again malignancy should be very high on your list of differentials commonly from the liver colon gall bladder pancreas lymphomas leukemias then if you have a lady with a menstrual abnormality or abnormal bleeding per vaginum then ovarian malignancy endometrial malignancy or a cervical malignancy as i already showed you earlier uh, amongst the ladies the malignancy is the second commonest cause of ascites after cirrhosis again if the patient has obstructive type of jaundice now obstructive jaundice as you know cld will have a hepatitis kind of picture where the transaminases are higher than the alkaline phosphatase but if you have a predominant direct jaundice with much higher alp then think of malignancy okay which is causing the ascites if you have a hard nodular enlarged liver because in cirrhosis you may have a hard liver you may have a nodular liver but it will be shrunken then abdominal or pelvic masses if you can palpate any abnormal masses besides the liver and spleen then think of a local cause like malignancy or an abscess or a pus collection if the patient has lymphadenopathy in the abdomen or outside the abdomen think of tb lymphomas hiv histoplasma if there is a past or a family history of tuberculosis again suspect local cause then if there is a sudden onset of ascites sudden hepatomegaly dilated veins lot of discomfort painful hepatomegaly tender hepatomegaly think of a butkari syndrome then if there are dilated tortuous veins in the flanks that means in the axillae and in the flanks of the abdomen with the flow upwards then think of ivc obstruction well in this case you will have prominent ascites but you will also have very prominent edema then there are patients who are on capd continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis with indwelling catheters the catheter is permanently or uh, for a long time it is put in the abdomen and so they can have infection and develop peritonitis and fluid collection there are certain special cases of a local cause like kylus ascites now kylus means a milky kind of ascites if any of you have seen it it is because of the raised triglyceride levels it is not because of the high cellular count or raised cholesterol it is because of raised triglycerides because kylus is made up of chylomicrons and chylomicrons are formed in the intestine when they triglycerides are absorbed and they are rich in triglycerides so this chyle accumulates it is very rich in triglycerides and the common causes are lymphedema due to lymphatic blockage this may be because of tumors uh, in, invading the lymphatics due to lymph nodes compressing on the lymphatics then the filarial infection which invades the lymphatics and blocks uh, the the adult worm lies in the lymphatics and blocks the lymph channels then lymphoma tuberculosis can also present as chylus ascites carcinoid tumors uh, are a notorious cause for chylus ascites previous radiation can damage the uh, lymphatics previous surgery can damage the lymphatics the lymphatics may be tied off then rarely cirrhosis okay so if you see chylus ascites then think of these causes now if you have a hemorrhagic ascites okay then the, which is non traumatic okay 
and how do you judge whether it is a hemorrhagic or a traumatic you do the hematocrit of the fluid if the hematocrit of the fluid is more than 50 percent of the hematocrit of the blood that means it is a traumatic ascites during the tapping blood you have punctured a vessel and that blood has entered the syringe while if the hematocrit is less than 50 percent of the uh, hematocrit of the blood then it is a pure hemorrhagic ascites or the blood is preformed in the uh, it has, the blood has come from the peritoneal cavity it is not a uh, from the blood vessel so the causes of hemorrhagic ascites are tuberculosis is one cause of hemorrhagic ascites pancreatitis malignancy perforation of any abdominal viscous and peritoneal dialysis they can also present with a hemorrhagic ascites straw color typically is described as deep yellow almost like mustard oil if you see mustard oil sarson ka tel it is exactly like that and that is typical of tuberculosis then one very interesting condition is a post op patient who has undergone some abdominal surgery especially pelvic surgeries in females where the gynecologists have uh, uh, inadvertently tied off or damaged the ureters the patient presents in post op with a uh, characteristically distension of abdomen uh, with the decreased urine output with pain abdomen uh, and the fluid in the abdomen so then that is the typical picture when they start suspecting urinary ascites so they they it's a very interesting way they diagnose it they they take out that fluid and they do the urea and creatinine so the urea and creatinine in that fluid should be higher than the urea and creatinine in blood again because urine is supposed to have a higher urea and creatinine than blood so if that is the case then that means it is urine and then they go ahead and uh, open up the patient again and then they repair the ureters so another uh, condition which you can witness is a sudden development of ascites over few hours to few days okay if this is the scenario then you must think of like i said acute but carry syndrome acute right heart failure which can be because of sudden massive pulmonary embolism or uh, some other acute right acute uh, right ventricular or inferior wall mi then the pancreatic ascites is also develops over just a few days if the patient is having chronic liver disease which is compensated but he suddenly uh, has a binge of alcohol or he has some fever or he has a viral infection and that he develops hepatitis and his liver disease decompensates so again he will present with sudden onset of ascites uh, another uh, liver condition which can present suddenly with ascites is acute liver cell failure so or massive liver necrosis which can be seen typically with massive uh, viral hepatitis or with high, high overdoses of paracetamol okay so there again acute liver failure patient will present with sudden development of ascites jaundice fatigue encephalopathy bleeding then if there is development of hepatocellular carcinoma in a pre existing chronic liver disease patient here again the ascites will develop very very fast over few days to a couple of weeks so then that this along with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis in a patient of cld uh, should lead us to uh, think of development of hepatocellular carcinoma or spot spontaneous bacterial peritonitis uh, hemoperitoneum obviously if it is traumatic or uh, due to a bleeding diathesis again will develop very fast uh, then if there is a perforation or intra abdominal infection again there is collection of fluid which gets infected forms a pus and patient will present within few days so once we have done the uh, history and examination you have a fairly good idea another part of your clinical examination a bedside procedure just like doing your 
ब्लड ग्लूकोज एस्टिमेशन और से इवन योर यूरिन डिपस्टिक इज एन असाइटिक फ्लूड एग्जामिनेशन ओके दिस इज पार्ट ऑफ योर क्लिनिकल साइड इवेल्युएशन ओके इट इज वेरी यूजफुल बिकॉज इट इज सेफ relatively painless can be repeated can be therapeutic also because it provides relief and distension and distress so it is a very useful procedure and uh, helps uh, uh, to narrow down your differentials very easily so these are just two laparoscopic pictures on the left you have that typical straw colored fluid which you see in tuberculosis and on the right side you have that milky white kind of fluid which is which is mostly looks like chylus but a similar kind of fluid can be seen in peritonitis also so once the fluid has been taken out so what do you do you look for the cells if polymorphs are predominant then it is peritonitis or spontaneous bacterial peritonitis if lymphocytes are predominant is likely to be tuberculosis cancer or a chyle then very important to do a malignant cell cytology if you are suspecting malignancy and here the dictum is to send three consecutive samples a good amount of fluid or 15 to 20 ml so then only they can cytospin and they can take out the sediment and see it under the microscope uh so yeah this was one study uh, done from fc by dr shama jain uh, hod pathology so they evaluated 11500 diffusion samples okay they got quite a large number and they found that adenocarcinoma was the most frequent cause of malignant peritoneal effusions okay now they are talking only of malignant effusions so adenocarcinoma was the most common cause and the most common malignancy to metastasize to the peritoneum was ovarian 54% okay so this is very useful uh, data from our own institution the other uncommon malignancies that they found in the ascites fluid were non hodgkins lymphoma some two cmls mesothelioma melanoma germ cell tumors okay but nhls were very common nhls and squamous cell carcinomas so out of the total 6340 acidic fluid samples uh, almost 5800 were negative Okay, so there the learning point is that not all malignancies will uh, give rise to cells. Maybe the diagnosis was not malignancy. Maybe the sample was sent wrongly. So the pickup rate is low. So that is why you need to have a very good pretest uh, probability or a very high pretest probability, and you need to send the sample three times in a good quantity and in heparinized vials. Okay. these are some of the photos of the unusual malignancies they found like acute lymphoid leukemia cells and this is not blood picture this is ascites fluid picture then the uh, uh, the the images full of lymphoblasts it looks almost like a blood picture then they found multiple myeloma in the ascites fluid see these are plasma cells the deep blue cytoplasm these are plasma blasts okay. which we normally have to do a bone marrow to see here they could find it in the ascites fluid so a lady 42 year old with metastatic ovarian malignancy so these are all malignant cells which they found in the ascites fluid so amongst the malignancies in 372 cases 200 were from the ovary <coughs> sorry 200 were from the ovary 80 were from the git some from breast some from lung so ovary and git these are the commonest okay now 
this is a very uh, well known concept so sag is not a ratio sag is a gradient gradient means when you subtract one thing from the other so what do you subtract from what serum to ascites albumin gradient that is serum albumin minus ascitic fluid albumin will give you the sag gradient okay the premise being that serum will have a higher albumin ascitic fluid will have a lower albumin it is always positive it can never be negative ascitic fluid cannot have a higher albumin than the serum okay so classically what has been described is that when the sag is more than 1.1 it is typically a transudate or when it is less than 1.1 it is a exudate but what we tend to call it is a high sag ascites or a low sag ascites so this is the newer terminology we don't call it transudate or exudate although some people would like to continue so once you find that it is a low sag ascites that means your the sag is less than 1.1 gram per deciliter then the conditions are mostly when well, local conditions okay uh, and why do you, why is nephrotic syndrome placed here the nephrotic syndrome is not a local condition all right because the serum albumin is so low okay if your serum albumin is low because of loss in the urine then obviously your sag is going to reduce so that is why it comes under the low sag category so typically earlier the nephrotic syndrome used to be placed in the high sag or the high gradient category and when you have uh, a high sag gradient then the two differentials here could be if the ascitic fluid protein is high or if it is low if you have a low ascitic protein that only means that the liver is not producing enough protein or albumin okay so that means predominantly a liver involvement so that is the broad this, uh, explanation of a sag more than 1.1 but ascitic protein less than 2.5 that means the liver is not functioning so liver disease what cirrhosis again liver synthetic function is gone massive liver metastasis the whole liver is replaced with mets so the liver cannot produce albumin then late bud carry in the bud carry is chronic so that causes ischemic damage and fibrosis of the liver again it cannot produce albumin so whenever a cytic protein is less than 2.5 with a high sag think of liver disease whenever the sag is high and the cytic protein is high that means the disease is outside the liver okay that means congestive heart failure pericarditis early bud carry early bud carry liver is fine it's just the hydrostatic forces which lead to the production of ascites ivc obstruction the uh, sinusoidal obstruction or the veno occlusive disease okay so this is how you see you see the sag if it is low sag usually it is a local cause plus nephrotic syndrome if it is a high sag it is liver disease or a non liver disease okay so this is the picture of a chylus fluid which has been taken out from the peritoneal cavity so it looks typically uh, milky uh, yellowish milky and uh, the triglyceride the characteristic is that the triglyceride level will be high okay and the cell count will also be high but it will be predominantly lymphocytes if the cell count is high with neutrophils in a cloudy ascites then don't think of chylus ascites think of peritonitis okay so this is how you differentiate between a chylus ascites and between a peritonitis uh, ascites ascites due to peritonitis okay so high triglyceride and lymphocyte counts which will be high so once again recapitulating what we have done till now the first step 
when you approach a case of uh, ascites is to go through the history and physical examination to dissect out whether the cause is a local cause or a systemic cause if the systemic causes we know it can be a liver disease it can be cardiac disease or it can be renal disease hypothyroidism or malabsorption then in local causes we know that commonest is tuberculosis malignancies even in malignancies we know that the ovarian and then the git malignancies are the commonest but we have unusual malignancies also so once you've done your history and physical examination accordingly uh then the next step should be an ascetic fluid analysis before you do anything else okay and for doing an abdominal paracentesis you don't require even an ultrasound you just need to do a clinical bedside test to see whether there is shifting dullness or fluid thrill and then just uh, with the proper technique do the uh static fluid tap in the static fluid tap the visual inspection can give you a good clue whether it is hemorrhagic whether it is pilus whether it is um foul smelling or whether the straw colored okay and then obviously you do the albumin estimation in the static fluid and the serum uh, in paired samples at the same time and then accordingly according to the uh, sag gradient you can find out after that so uh, so according to your suspected disease whatever findings are there in the aseptic fluid have been enumerated here okay if you are suspecting infection do cultures if you are suspecting tuberculosis do a pcr or ad activity if you are suspecting it is looking like kyle then order for triglycerides because triglyceride in the aseptic fluid nobody does uh, routinely you have to specially order it okay so similarly uh, urea and creatinine nobody does in the aseptic fluid you have to specifically order them and sometimes they don't do it because they are they don't know why you have ordered urea creatinine the technicians they don't know why you have ordered urea creatinine in the aseptic fluid so then you have to talk to the pathologist or the biochemist the doctor and tell them ki see this is the reason this is how i have seen the gynae people do it they they extract the fluid and then the pg takes it to the lab talks to the doctor ki see this is a cytic fluid we are suspecting urinary leakage please do urea test there there is no fun in doing protein or albumin or cytology na no? you are not suspecting tuberculosis in that case similarly in pancreatic disease if you want to do amylase amylase should be very high in pancreatic disease But they don't do a static fluid amylase so easily. So if you are really suspecting, then go and talk to them. So what should you do next? You have a fair idea. Okay, from my history investig uh, history examination in a static fluid analysis, I am dealing with these one or two possibilities. So the next best investigation. first investigation least uh, expensive least invasive fastest investigation is the ultrasound of the abdomen okay get it done uh then in the ultrasound you will be able to see the liver the spleen any local pathology uh, and just rule out basically liver disease or pancreatic disease any malignancy uh then if you are suspecting any local cause go for a ct abdomen if you are suspecting a cardiac cause order for an echo and uh, similarly in blood you can look for viral markers or tumor markers uh if you suspect malignancy or tuberculosis go for lymph node fnac if you get nothing then no nothing in the echo nothing in the ultrasound nothing in the cytic fluid basically it's all inconclusive then the final port of call is a laparoscopy or a laparotomy because there they go in they drain the fluid they take out the fluid they inspect the bowel inspect the liver surface inspect the peritoneum take a peritoneal biopsy okay and they do a direct visualization and then everything becomes crystal clear the where is the likely pathology that they can even visualize minor uh 
you know, healed, uh, sealed perforations uh, from tuberculosis uh, or small early masses uh, of peritoneal carcinomatosis, which are not visible on the ultrasound or CT. So if everything else is failing, then ask the surgeons for, to do a laparoscopy or a laparotomy. This will be a final call. So this, uh, in brief, was uh, your approach to uh, a case of ascites. Uh, basically, it is all clinical. And after your history and examination, you should be able to make a, a fairly uh, accurate diagnosis. And whatever uh, doubts are left can be clarified by doing an ascitic fluid analysis. That will uh, give you uh, almost 100% diagnosis whether you are dealing with cirrhosis or malignancy or tuberculosis. And hardly we require to do investigations like CT or biopsy. No, only if we don't uh, get uh, clear-cut evidence of cirrhosis or tuberculosis, then we go ahead and do these uh, other investigations. Because in India, we I have already told you, commonest cause is cirrhosis and tuberculosis. Okay? Third commonest cause is malignancy. So if cirrhosis and TB, we can easily make out from the history examination and cytic fluid analysis. Maximum, we need an ultrasound after. So just to complete the uh, this thing, there is a very good video on paracentesis from NEJM. Uh, this is the link to that uh, video. Okay. So I'll try to play this video. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a 10 minute video. Uh, I, I will not take 10 minutes here, but I think you can, you can uh, see it yourself. Uh, when you open this link, you can search for it on any JM. Okay, you will get the video. And uh, so that is the end of my lecture. If uh, there is anything, you can put it uh, a minute. Somebody, Pariniti. I said, sir, how to check for pulsatile hepatomegaly? Okay, pulsatile hepatomegaly, very easy. You you palpate the edge of the liver as you do normally, starting from the right iliac fossa, move up. And where you feel the edge of the liver, just place, keep your hand over there and pas allow patient to breathe normally, no deep breathing. And you will feel the edge hitting your hand, going back, hitting along with the pulsations of the carotid. Okay, so one movement is there with the uh, this thing uh, respiration. So you can ask, you can also ask the patient to hold breath in deep inspiration for a few seconds, and at that time, you when you feel the edge of the liver, it will be pulsatile. When you uh, palpate the carotid artery with your thumb, you will feel it to be pulsatile. The breath held in inspiration. Okay. And then Shiveha has asked, sir, PMN count in cirrhosis for SBP. Yeah, so it is more than 250 cells per cubic millimeter of polymorphonuclear lymphocyte, polymorphonuclear leukocyte. So that is neutrophils. Remember, SBP is not only seen in cirrhosis. SBP can be seen in any ascitic fluid which has low protein content. So low protein content, why? Because that means there are less of immunoglobulins. So there is less of antibacterial activity. And so the bacteria which transmigrate across the bowel wall and enter into the peritoneal cavity, into the fluid, they are normally destroyed by the immunoglobulins. But if there are less of immunoglobulins, as in cirrhosis, then they propagate and produce peritonitis. So other Two other conditions where you can get SBP, one is nephrotic syndrome and the other is SLE. So SBP is not unique or confined to cirrhosis only. So any, any acidic fluid where you have less of uh, immunoglobulins or less of protein, you can get SBP. Okay. And this is different from 
any infection which is introduced from the outside so that is not spontaneous that is atrogen so if uh, if i was audible in everything so i think we can end our uh, session now if any questions then you can probably uh, pass it on to your cr and they can let me know okay shall we so nilayan says sbp is more common in transitive yes yes sbp is more common in transitive yes so so we close the session now thank you so much for your attention and time and i hope you understood something about the cites okay just read up a little bit read few good articles and you will uh, there will be no more doubts okay thank you bye bye have a nice day enjoy the rains